Hello? Gil, this is a problem. Hey. So as if uh, sentient and trying to help make my point, FaceTime audio just friggin' stopped working in the middle of my sentence about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't get why it's so unreliable. It's like... When I... Go ahead. Well, I'm going to explain something, and it's going to be very clunky and probably wrong. But (laughs) uh, (laughs) I was watching this thing about, like, audio and how it was transmitted, like, when, you know, phones were just becoming kind of a thing. And Mm -hmm. what they were doing to, like, save space is, um, and this this is the part that I'm going to butcher, but there's, like, so much data that you can transfer uh, over, you know, whatever the phone line was back then. I, I think it's even the same now. Obviously not what we're doing okay. now. This is the internet, but uh, phone lines back then, there was, like, only so much data that you could use. And the way audio works, obviously, is it's a sample of frequencies, uh, but they're so small that when put together, it sounds like a voice or, like, music or whatever. Mm-hmm. And what they did back then was they would, like, skip... Um, frequencies or whatever uh frequency might, might even be the wrong word but they would like I say you like, have this is a phoneme maybe i don't know yeah i don't know but yeah each unit of like okay yeah so. but e- each line would have like every third maybe or every fourth or maybe even every second like frequency so you weren't getting the full data you're getting like the one next to it or the one like two away from it so it was mm-hmm. sounding good enough that you could understand what was going on but it was like sharing the same group of data, just less samples of the audio, if that makes that's sense. Interesting. Um, and that's yeah. how they're putting more calls through the same line. But like since then, mm. the standard was established and then it's like they've just kept doing it that way. Well, I don't know if it's just the way of the world, but I feel like maybe this isn't possible for reasons I don't understand. But it seems like it would be possible to just completely tank the quality, you know, back down to like regular phone call potato quality yeah uh rather than getting the glitchy sounds and failed calls and things like that i don't totally get it i'm sure it's very difficult problem somehow um but boy would i love somebody you know like just i just it doesn't even seem like anyone stresses that like the quality yeah um well i mean twitch and stuff can stream 4k video and audio with a reliable connection pretty much fine for the most part just audio is like a small small fraction of that can't we make at least that reliable yeah well so that's what i was going to say uh for a little while i talked with my girlfriend because like facetime wasn't working like uh facebook audio call or whatever uh so i was like let's use this thing that is has been developed for gamers which you know they need that precision this is a case where they need it right where they need the not lag and not a drop and you you don't hear what they say or whatever um and so there's a thing i think called blaze that has an app and i don't know if it really worked better but we did give that uh, a try and it seemed all right maybe we should should use uh blaze and if it's not called blaze it'll be in the show notes with whatever it's actually called because i gotta check on that yeah i haven't heard of that yeah, it's not like a huge thing. It might not even exist anymore. Um, but, you know, there's uh, there's other things like it, like team team speak. Does that do that? Am I making stuff up? Uh, <laughs> yeah, don't, I don't you know. You know what, actually, know. you know what the best audio experience I've ever had in my life that wasn't like with a human in real, like real life? <laughs> yeah, what? It was the Xbox live uh just xbox live and then i had the little wireless microphone thing oh yeah that that wireless microphone was like precursor to these airpods like it was it was just wireless it had a little mute button very well designed and and lightweight and i just they did great on that and live was very consistent about the like audio not dropping yeah that's true i used to play so on really xbox like- live all the time and i don't remember ever being frustrated about the audio going down right yeah and like it was it was just great because yeah you could just mute it and keep listening and um it was was a good 
good system. Um, I have one piece of follow-up if we want to go ahead and, I guess, start the show. Oh, yeah. Let's start the show. What's up? <laughs> What's bothering you? What's bothering someone? Is this someone? Did someone follow up? Or we're following up on ourselves? Following up on ourselves. <laughs> we haven't gotten any follow-up yet, so if people want to, if people want to start yeah, commenting, yeah. Like, uh, No promises here, Twitter. people. But, like, you know, if we keep going and we get, like, 100, 200 episodes, maybe get a little following. If you want to be, like, the first person that gives us feedback, <laughs> that'd be cool. We need a... We talk about Hello Internet a lot, but uh, and that kind of goes into what my follow-up is, but we need some sort of, like, Medal of Honor for first uh, listener that uh, contacts cool. us. Actually, I have, I have a thing related to this that we'll talk about in a little bit, but, yeah. Yeah, we do. We need that. Okay, so because we talk about Hello Internet a lot... Um, an episode just came out today and Gray kind of talks about the, how AirPods have hit like kind of critical mass and have become acceptable. It's just like Mm -hmm. a fashion thing. They're not like ugly anymore. And I just want to go on the record saying the episode that our last episode where we talk about that, we recorded that before that episode uh, and it's, comes out after that Hello Internet episode, and we're, we're not just stealing topics from Hello Internet. All right, good to get on the record. I honestly, I don't remember, I, I listened to that episode, and I don't, I don't remember us talking about it, I don't remember them talking about it, but I'll take, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> I promise. Oh yeah, I do, I remember us a little bit, a little bit. I have a little mini starter topic, which is that, this is just a note, but I pretty much about like an hour or two ago, uh, I got back from caving. Uh, oh, really? I'm in Kentucky. Yeah, and it's, I guess it's big on caves here. Uh, so we just headed out. And what's really cool is this was the first one that I've done that was like uh, for a purpose. I mean, I've only actually, this is my second one. But the first one was just for fun. And so this time we went to a cave and we went all up in it. And uh, we brought with us this big honking, you know, it's like a, a briefcase, hard hard shell briefcase that has a LiDAR in it. And so there, there's a project where they're scanning the whole cave and everything. So That's cool. I've gone yeah. on like and tours at Mammoth Cave, but I've never done like oh. caving. So what cave did you yeah. go in? We went to one called Big Bat. Um and it's a pretty big cave. I think it's like 14 miles worth of cave altogether. Uh, but so for this project, they've, you know, like taken this big honking scanner and set it up and it takes like five minutes for one scan. But they've got like, like, I think he said 2.7 miles worth of scans, which is just like, like so much work. And I don't even From know. that one scan or no, combined? No, like over the course of this project where they're just uh, trying to like scan basically the whole cave eventually i guess but um and is you know, this like uh creating like a model of the cave or what's the scanning yeah okay yeah so there's a model in the end it's a little bit up in the air in question about like what we do with that model because it sort of started as like just for fun because it's uh somebody that works somewhere had like access to a scanner um but it's really cool and i went into cave and i got data and technically that's kind of an expedition and i just think that's like i love that word and yeah that's kind really of like cool like, yeah so did you stay in the cave like overnight no no we were in there like six hours or something like that that's awesome like so yeah were you did you scan or uh like record data for anything else you know there so this part usually they do a few but there was one bad scan from like the last trip. So this was, and like one person's leaving soon and everything. So they just, we basically went in and did three scans, like basically in the same area. Uh, so it wasn't super intense and I really didn't contribute much except for carrying some of the equipment, but, um, it was pretty cool. And so, so to describe it a little bit, it's kind of interesting. They set this tripod up, uh, and they put the big, laser thingy on the tripod and it's got a low interface so you get it going and everything but once it gets going uh what we would do is so you don't want to be in the scan that it takes because i guess it goes like 360 uh we basically hid behind rocks and this thing is like oh. beeping and blinking these blue lights and everything and like scanning uh you know like in like the first incredibles that like thing oh, yeah. that mr incredible not found or whatever you know 
It was like that. Uh, and it was just super weird and alien to see like this, this beeping little, I don't know. It felt like an alien spacecraft, like on a asteroid or something. It was just, it was cool. It was a cool experience. Caving, pretty cheap to get into, highly recommend it. And, uh, it's fun. You just get away from everything. Do you need like special permits to get into the cave and just start scanning things? Oh, that's where it gets really fun. Cause it's like, uh. There's this whole history, and there's like multiple groups, um, you know, like who owns what cave and can, things like that. But basically, so I'm going with a guy that that knows this stuff, and uh, like the organization he's worth, the organization he's with essentially owns these caves. Um, but a lot, you know, it's just if you request from some like society or whatever, and like each city seems to have several. Uh, you just get permission basically. And like, no, definitely no like permit on paper thing. You just maybe sign a waiver if the particular organization like wants you to, but gotcha. that seems to be about it. What's really, really cool, cool too, too actually, is that these caves, caves a lot of times are not, not, um, this one was, but like one that I went to before doesn't have like its location pretty like recorded. It, it's well explored and it has a plaque outside and things. It's actually this really awesome big sinkhole thing or not sink. It's like a big, just giant hole and it repels down for like 140 feet. Mm. Um, But it's, it's on private property, but like the location is not just posted on the internet because it's like, they're trying to kind of, you know, if you're not supposed to be there, the only thing that posting it on the internet is going to do is like let people that aren't supposed to be there show up and, you know, go into the cave and everything. So it's like, there's, there's this little secret world of, caves and locations and you gotta have the the key usually they have some kind of well not sometimes i guess they don't but sometimes they do have like a gate or um for this one actually we went through like an unnatural entrance so it's like man-made and it was just the storm drain essentially going down like 40 feet uh and a ladder so you, yeah. you you have to unlock this big heavy metal door thing and it felt just like fallout or like some kind of nuclear bunker type situation yeah, at uh, Mammoth Cave, the I've been to, I think it's just called the main entrance, uh, but it, it looks very much like Lost, like you're going into this like underground bunker sort of thing. It's just like a big steel door just on the side of a rock, and you just walk yeah. down. But have you ever been to Mammoth Cave? No, I want to get to Mammoth. It's really cool. It's fun yeah. to like go down and camp and then do like a cave, like, like do a cave tour and then camp. Yeah, I, don't, I don't even have a concept of like... Like, I see pictures of it, but I've seen pictures of these other ones, too, and I just still don't have a concept of, like, where is it? How do you get to it? That kind of thing. Um, so uh, it'd yeah. be cool to do and, and see kind of the contrast. Mammoth, though, is, like, the famous one that was, like, a huge tourist draw. And so this is what I was talking about with this competition is people used to, like, you know, back in the 30s or 40s, I think, people used to, like, stand by the road in front of where Mammoth uh like the entrance was and be like, Oh yeah, sorry folks. It's, uh, it's closed or there was like a, a cave in or something and they would draw people to like other caves in the area. Oh really? That's funny. Yeah. It's, it was like a whole, it's called, there's a, there's a Wikipedia, like maybe not main article, but like sub article thingy on one of the pages that's called like the Kentucky cave wars. So it's, it's interesting stuff. It's funny you talk about, so, I've gotten into a new uh, adventure hobby this past weekend, too. Oh, what was uh, that? So we've, my wife and I, we like hike a lot and we camp at least once a year. Um, but camping is, you kind of like, you know, they're always at campgrounds. You just drive up and, you know, throw down a tent and hang out overnight and then do some hiking. Um, mm-hmm. but in Seattle or, or around the, like the, the Northwest region of Washington, people are like super into hiking. So any sort of campground is out of the question, unless you're going to reserve it a month in advance. And every time we mm-hmm. go camping, it's like, eh, we should probably go camping this weekend. Uh, so last week we kind of had that thought and then realized that we couldn't go camping. Um, but we, basically like made the decision to start backpacking so last week we got all the backpacking equipment which it's fairly expensive to get started because you have to Mm -hmm. buy like all the special stuff like you have to buy the backpack which is expensive and then like the tent and the sleeping bags are all expensive because you need them to be Uh, like really lightweight and very small and then expand out to like uh, you're not talking about like 
baby backpacking here. You're, no, you're I'm like, talking like we bought a stove. We bought like <laughs> <laughs> we got like all the little pieces that you need. So you, you slept over where do you sleep? What? How does this work? So what we did this past weekend was um, we went to a, it's called Mount Townsend. So it's about mm-hmm. a 10 mile hike round trip. Um, it's not too bad for backpack. And we just went for one night. We want to eventually do like a week or at least like a couple of days. But mm-hmm. we just did the one night, just 10 miles, but maybe like maybe plus 2,500 feet, something like that in elevation. And uh, you're like, like, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, then at the top, it's around like 6,000 feet. But what you do is you have your backpacks, you have it loaded up with all of your stuff. You hike the five miles to the top and you kind of set up camp. And uh, maybe I'll add a picture or two, but like the view up there is just like, like beautiful. It's like mm. all these mountains and you're like in the clouds. So every once in a while, you just can't really see anything. Or if you're like on a ledge, it's just like pure white. Uh, and then the clouds will pass and you get like all of the Olympic National Forest, like the Olympic Mountains. Uh, it was really, really cool. It was a lot of fun. We're going to be doing that probably a lot this weekend or this summer. Yeah, Seattle seems really good for that. Yeah, it is. Yeah, we've gone yeah. on a lot of hikes since we got here, but it's like we want to camp too, so we're gonna we're gonna do a lot more backpacking and like camping at different places. But and you, so you said camping's tricky, but then what if you're hiking? You can just set up a tent wherever, and that's fine. Or yeah, so camping's tricky because it has to be at a campground, but you can't take your your camping stuff like to just like backcountry camping because it's all so heavy. So you yeah. need like special equipment that's like super lightweight. You need the but backpack and all that stuff. But it's allowed, yeah. And in, in different different areas have different rules. Uh, so like the mm-hmm. national forests or the national parks, most of the for most of the trails don't allow dogs. And we're not going to go backpacking without our dog. So we're mm-hmm. kind of that kind of limits us there. Um, yeah. yeah. But a lot of the national forests, or I think all the national forests, allow dogs, and there's like other things that you can go in. And then some of them require permits, some don't. Uh, Mount Townsend requires no permits. There's just a small lot at the bottom. Uh, permits are fairly cheap, though. If you do need to buy a permit, it's like I think it's like thirty dollars for a year or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it depends on where you camp. But uh, there there are tons of places online. Uh, Washington Trails Association has a website that's like actually good. It's like a government website that's it's actually helpful. And uh, mm-hmm. you can find really cool stuff. You can sort by all these different, like I want to, you know, 10 miles allows dogs, allows camping, no permits. And then you basically have a list of places that you can go and you just go and hike and camp wherever. Awesome. Yeah. So it's, it's fairly expensive to like get started, but once you're started, it's just the cost of gas. It's basically. not expensive if you don't stay overnight, right? No, yeah, if you're just hiking, it's, you know, you just have to buy yeah, boots yeah. And, and, like, a, a backpack that can fit water, basically. But if yeah, you're you going to stay the night, you have to buy all this equipment. Yeah, I feel like you could get, you know, good experience, too, just off of, of of hiking it. And then, like, okay, this is worth it. Let me go get the stuff for it. Yeah, yeah. Mount Townsend, like I said, is short enough to, like, just do a hike. Like, there were people just, like, on their daily run, just, like, running up the mountain. But like at you, the top is like really awesome, <laughs> and we we wanted to camp and stay. So, are you gonna do Mount Rainier? I don't yeah, even Mount, know if that's near you, but yeah, that's really close. Okay, um, okay. We've been to Mount Rainier, but to like actually backpack to the peak is like something we're not ready for yet. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know all the details, but like you need even more special equipment. And if yeah. you're going to do it, you probably want to do it with some sort of guide because there are some places where it's like avalanche prone and it's, it's a little more dangerous. Um, it's nothing like, you know, um, Mount Everest or like K2 or anything, but it's, yeah. it, you, you, have, you still have to know what you're doing to, or else it's, it could be really dangerous. Is that, is that I, I don't remember, I mean, I mean, I've never been to Seattle, but uh, is that, can you see a big mountain like in the background from places in the city? Or am yeah. I just imagining that? Yeah, if I take a step out of my where I'm recording right now, you can see Mount, Mount Rainier is like out and it towers over everything. Oh, that's so cool. I need to get there. Yeah. So it's like yeah. where I live is like on the lake and then there's like a, just a huge mountain on the right side and there's like a bunch of mountain range like all ah. in the middle. 
and if it, it's overcast a lot here, but it's like we've oh, been yeah. here for a month and a half, and Mount Rainier's out, you know, a few times a week, and still every time it's like, wow, th- that thing is huge. Hmm. I love that. I love that it's just this cool, inspiring thing, like constantly in the distance. Yeah. There are some like really cool places. So there's a place called Cary Park, which is like a park up on the hill. And then there's, it's a great view of like downtown Seattle, but then right Mm. behind it is Mount Rainier kind of like towering over everything. If you have like Mm. a good enough, like the iPhone camera just like doesn't really capture it. Um, It looks really small, but like when you're in person or if you have a nice camera, it's like, it looks huge. And that's probably like the most common picture there is like, downtown seattle and then a big mount rainier in the background okay yeah i think i've seen that picture yeah that's, that's why i have that idea. idea well so, so we, we, we got, got a little into uh, adventure, adventure you know nature type stuff there and i like that that's nice uh it makes us different you know yeah it doesn't doesn't fit the name so much but yeah, so sometimes you've got to get away <laughs> from the technology and uh yeah well, so let, let me bring it back to nerdy, and then we're going to go slightly back out into the adventure nature okay. area. So I posted yesterday to Reddit. It was it was a lot of work, actually. I, I had to take um, like a picture and Photoshop a bunch and everything, but I posted just a, a concept of a watch. Oh, and I, I sent it to you, so you know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you sent you sent me a little bit of a thing back, but do you not think that that would be super useful as a as a feature? I guess we can describe yeah. it real quick. Well, I was going to ask you more about it yesterday, but I wanted to talk to you about it on here. Like, really, really pitch the idea of of this to me and what like okay. what the advantage of it is. Okay. Yeah. So the quick pitch on the on the I call it the NASA mission clock mode for uh, the Timex it's an it's a Timex Iron Man so it has just four buttons on the side and one in the middle and it's it's not a super impressive you know it's a digital watch it's what all the digital watches look like um but so basically i have this problem and it has mostly occurred during flights when i have a flight where i'm like man i just want to count down until departure time right until like this plane leaves without me i want to see that time just by looking at my wrist immediately and so you know what i usually do currently is i set one of these timers and i i like do the math in my head on like how many hours and minutes it is until that time and then i set the timer and then i like wait until the seconds hand hits zero on the phone and then hit start on the watch and it's like it's a heck of a process. I probably don't need to get it down to the seconds, but either way, I still have to do the math, and it's just not great. Uh, my alternative to this is I have, I've thought about this some, and what it basically is is you set an alarm. Okay, so instead of the timer mode or the... or the, So these watches usually have a timer that counts down, a chronograph that counts up, and like alarms that just ring at the, the alarm timer or whatever. So my idea here is what if you can set an alarm, but instead of just being an alarm that does nothing until it's the time and then beeps or whatever, what if when you set the alarm, it gives you a countdown until that alarm? I find that just incredibly useful because then I don't have to do math. I don't have to get the second perfect. It's just a lot more intuitive. So basically, uh, this concept is you set an alarm, it gives you a countdown until that alarm, and then you know, the alarm can go off right at zero, like a normal alarm would. But then also after that, just as a bonus too, it'll start to go into positive time. Um, So essentially what it's doing is just counting up, but it starts in, in the negatives, you know, it's T minus whatever, which is like the the NASA uh, countdown clock, like at Kennedy space center. So the, the idea then is just, Oh, how long has it been since this event of importance or how long is it until this event of importance? So caveat here is that I briefly owned an Apple Watch Series 3 LTE for two weeks, and then I returned it at the 14 days where you're not allowed to, you know, you got to return it by 14 days. Um, There's a lot of reasons that we're not going to get into it, but um, I did have one. And while I had it, I actually had one of these kind of countdown apps on there. 
and uh, m- almost all of them. The one that I got wasn't like just it wasn't super impressive to me. Was this an app or was it like did it have a complication that did everything you needed? Oh yeah, it, so it's an app and it has a widget that goes with the app, but then also it has a watch app that goes with the regular app. So like you can use this app without a watch, but um, it, it has an app for the watch or a, or a complication. Okay. Cause whatever. I've found I like the apps, if you have to go into the app to use the thing and, or to like monitor it, it's much less useful to me. It's gotta be on the watch face. Yeah, no, it definitely needs to be there. And it did have a complication for this, but it, it was not perf like very well designed. It was more, it was very obviously geared towards like counting towards a date a lot of these seem to be big on that. Like, oh, when's Christmas? And I I don't know. That just seems to be the more popular thing. Mm -hmm. And it's just, I'd like it to be, and if you see, if you look at my interface or my little mock-up, I made sure to make it super easy to adjust. And I also don't see that on the watch. So basically, like if my flight gets delayed five minutes, I can press the button five times and now my alarm is adjusted. Um, Yeah. So it's it's really about like it being a convenient, useful type thing, and then yeah. So for the Apple Watch, like I won't get into all the reasons that I just I returned mine, but like you got to charge it every time. It's like another uh, another vessel for notifications to get at you. It's not super rugged. It's you know possible to like. You know, it's pretty good. It's pretty well designed, but it, like just due to the fact that it's trying to do so much, it's possible to end up like on a different screen or whatever. Um, it's just not going to be the case on like one of these dedicated watches. And yeah. obviously the screen, you know, there was rumor that this might not be the case pretty soon, but currently the screen won't just stay on. And I know you flick your wrist and it looks at you and whatever, but like, I just want the screen on. I don't want to deal with the wrist tap thing. Yeah. Yeah. I I just, I just want a simple, um, you know, simple electronics can be really useful, especially in like situations where it's not, um, like, like high stress, like extreme environments, I guess is what I'd call it, where it's like, you don't see the military, uh, special ops. Well, like there's some apps, but you don't see special ops with like an iPhone or anything touchscreen because it's just, they just yeah. need simple electronics that work really well. So to, so to really be performance, like a power user, um, a lot of times it's easier just to have physical buttons and, and like a dedicated interface. Yeah. I think like, I think the Kindle's a good example of that. Like yeah. everything is trying to be like, this is the only device you need, but the Kindle is like, no, this is just a reading device and it's built to be just that the battery lasts two months. It it's e ink. It's not super. It's not like some high refresh rate screen. It's just black and white. Uh, it's built specifically for this thing. It's waterproof. Um, so yeah, you don't see a whole lot of that. But I will back up the Apple Watch a little bit just because this is like now an irreplaceable part of my like workflow. Uh, mm-hmm. The like notifications are like very customizable uh, as far as like w- what you can allow to let into the watch. And I, I've got like a whole kind of philosophy yeah. around that, but the the only downside for me is the battery life. Like, I was trying to track our hike this weekend up to where we were going to camp, and by the time we got up there, it was like a three hour hike, and the watch was dead, and it was like noon. So it's like yeah. it's got to be like with regular daily use, it's got to get to like a week. I would I think. And then like heavy, heavy use, like three or four days. That would be ideal. But like the battery technology is just like moving so slowly, it seems. Or at least when battery technology does get better, instead of making the life longer, they just like add more power intensive like features to it. But yeah, I would love to see the Apple Watch get there. And then it really would be like my perfect device. But aside from that, yeah. Um, yeah. I was just, well, one thing really quick is I think maybe FaceTime lagged and you like it did the thing. See, this is let's talk about this analog audio, right? It's never you can might lose it, but it's never gonna like 
speed up to catch up or whatever. You know how sometimes you literally hear a faster voice because it's catching up? Yeah. yeah. I think it just did that maybe. So if we're editing, like now the time might be unsynced or whatever. So I just wanted to say that. To to your point about the watch, yes. I mean, battery technology, it just has so far to come before it's... We're talking about years. I, I didn't even... This little Timex watch that I have, I bought it like three years ago. I forgot about it. I got it back out and, and I set the time again and it's good to go. Um, I love that compared to the daily charge. So you're talking about at least like, you know, several orders of magnitude difference. Uh, oh, yeah. And how frequently you have to deal with battery stuff. And yeah, the Apple Watch can be good and I see where it's going. And there's even some of those like, hybrid watches that don't really have a display but they point at things with the the hands to tell you information have you seen those yeah 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 and that's a cool combo but i kind of want the digital i want a digital hybrid watch that'd be amazing um but i have yet to see one that at least does it well and um but yeah i just i just think like i don't want a second phone on my wrist and i'll do my mini rant about the apple watch here yet again is it was expensive and like it, the the locking thing, I had to friggin unlock my wristwatch and like, yeah, it's just, what other things did I not? It, notifications is just like, there's separate do not disturb modes if you want, but if you don't do the separate do not disturb modes, like, I don't know. It was just very complicated with notifications and stuff. And then you got a whole, um, yeah, separate settings menu in the watch and things and just... Uh, it was it was just complicated. And you know what I want? I want a simple thing that sits on my wrist um, and th- that aids me, like with essentially just timers. It's a clock, right? It's a timepiece. It should be really good at time stuff. And yeah. uh, the, the Timex does really well at that. I just wish it had this cool feature because I would use it pretty much exclusively and constantly. Yeah, I think app, like, I don't really know. It's hard to say because everybody uses the watch differently, but... I think maybe it would be nice if they like had all notifications on the watch off by default, aside from like the phone and maybe messages because it gives people a wrong idea. Cause what you just said, like you don't want a tiny phone on your wrist. That's exactly what people shouldn't be thinking of when they think of the Apple watch. It should, they, it should be thought of as a watch that can do more things, not a phone that can do less things. And I think when you think about it like that, it's like becomes much more useful. It's like, it's not to replace the phone. It's to like do a very specific thing for any, it's basically my heads up display for things like, uh, weather timers, uh, when is the sunset, things like that. Yeah. And actually, I I don't know. I'm, so I'm listening to backlog of fellow internet episodes and I think it was an old one. But I swear, like, so they have this part where Gray specifically says, don't think of the Apple Watch as a mini iPhone. Um, And he's right. I agree with that. (laughs) Technically, I guess they said that a a few years ago now, like when the Apple Watch first came out. Um, But yeah, I mean, you got to treat it as something different. And it's pretty good if you do that. And if you set it up all perfectly and you keep it charged every day and you spend 400 or whatever dollars on it in the first place i don't know it's just a lot of complication like i definitely see why not everyone has an apple watch right now yeah but it's still like very popular i I see it everywhere yeah but and i don't see though why i mean i guess i just think like i'm surprised there's not more popularity of just like really functional watches and this was what i was talking about is um you know these rolexes it's like I don't know. It's precise, I guess. It keeps time decently, but it's a clock. That's all it can do. It can maybe do a, a timer or the date, in like if it's really fancy. Um, yeah, so I'm not super impressed by those. Well, that's partially like obviously branding, but they're also like really high quality, like handcrafted thing. watches. Like the yeah. the like the the amount of like if you ever open like see the inside of a um like omega speed seamaster or some sort of rolex like 
the like there's like like so many tiny 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 pieces in there that like are like such precision little pieces and it's not just like some you know like five dollar watch that has just like a few things going on and maybe some like board in there like it's a it's a mechanical thing it's like very complicated it's like mesmerizing watching people work on them i guess yeah, if you find that interesting, I suppose. I, I just would rather have... Yeah, but to your point, it just tells the time. Yeah. So. yeah, and then you wind them, you know? So it's like, it's a therapeutic thing almost. Like, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, this leads me, though, to a brand of watch that I discovered in the process of looking at all this stuff. Um, actually... I, you know, I was I was desperately trying to find a watch that at least starts counting up after it counts down from a timer. That's even pretty hard to come by. Um, but in the process, I found... Actually, at one point, I was just like, I remember the movie Clock Stoppers. You remember the movie Clock Stoppers? You ever mm, see that? No. It's like a really not not great movie. You know, it's pretty low budget. Um in like probably early 2000s or something. But like the plot is they have a wristwatch that stops time. Um, but anyway, I, I, I vaguely remembered that that was like a pretty cool looking watch. And so I looked up what that watch was and I found out of that the Sunto brand. Sunto. I think they're Finnish or one of those countries. I know that those countries get mad if you say they're the country that's like next to them, but um, <laughs> somewhere around there. And so what they do is they make like almost adventure watches is basically what I would call it. It's like for like hunters, fishers, military use. Uh, it's essentially like just a, a lot more expensive and cool version of my little Timex Iron Man uh, digital watch. But, it, you know, theirs looks pretty good. And uh, yeah, it's just a, it's a cool watch. So I, I, I like those ones right now. I've got the site pulled up. These look like smart watches that are the battery life there. Oh yeah. So some of the watches that they make are basically smart watches and that's no good. There's also some with GPS. Oh, I see. And, okay. and you can like choose to not use GPS, but still it's probably going to kill a battery on that one. So I like the one that's called the Sunto Essential, which is just, you know, no fancy stuff. Um, It has, I guess they're called like ABC watches. So it has altimeter, barometer, and maybe chronographer, chronograph, chronograph, I think is the C. Trying to find it now. So this is like a whole other thing, but these cookies, like we're using cookies, like this big banner is just like taking up the top of the page and won't let me move it. Oh, on their website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, these look cool. Um, they, yeah, they look like very specialized um, pieces. Yeah, I think they're just like quality watches. I mean, unfortunately, they got into smart watches because I guess they had to. But some of their watches are really like, you know, rugged. This is just trying to do a few things really well. And you, most of them relate to time. Um, what I love is they actually seem to be a, a compass manufacturer more than anything. Uh, so the watches have this 3d, almost all of them, I think have a 3d compass feature, which is like a compass, but your watch doesn't have to be flat. So it's like, it doesn't really care if it's, you know, 90 degrees or whatever. That's cool. Five degrees with the surface. I found this essential. This one is really nice looking. Yeah. I kind of want that. Except I twit, I twitted, I tweeted at them um requesting this thing that i mocked up because i really want that in there and i would just buy it immediately if it had that feature so and it's like uh, it's like 10 lines of code to implement that so i don't i don't see what the big deal would be yeah that should be very very simple man this watch is 800 dollars. oh yeah they get up there i think the essentials can be just like 300 though it's on sale for 400 this essential it's this is the copper which is still, that's what I said, like, with the Timex that I have. It was 40 bucks at Walmart. Like, yeah. that still even seems like a lot for a watch, but whatever. And then, it, so if they're up to $300, it's really, like, why don't I just get an Apple Watch? But 
eh, I think I would like that. The Sunto. Yeah. Uh, there's a watch. It's like a watch that I really like that Brady's talked about. I forget what it's called, but oh. it's a 24 hour watch and it only has one hand. So it's like, oh, it's you don't you, like, you never need to know exactly what time it is. So you basically know the time up to the next like quarter of an hour. Um, and it's just 24 hour watch. It allows you like very, it's like basically where the sun is essentially. It's like just a single line mm-hmm. and if one rotation is 24 hours. Uh, I would really, really like that watch just for, like pure simplicity sake. And I've really looked into buying it, but then the Apple watch really took over. But yeah, I, I've had a lot of watches and I do like the functionality, but before I've had, I had a, a Skagen or Skagen watch, which is these like super thin looking watches. And I had like the most minimal one possible. Like it has, I think it has two hands, but there's nothing else on the face. It's just two hands. Um, mm. And then another one I had was the one face watch, which was kind of like, it was a cool project because like the money went towards, depending on the color you bought, it went towards a different charity cause thing. Um, but, but it was like just this super basic, you know, all it does is tell the time. It has like two buttons on it. And it almost, it looks like a smartwatch. People think it's a smartwatch when I wear it, but I yeah. think that one's pretty cool. I'm looking at it now. It does look nice. But, but before the Apple watch, um, I wore, are you familiar with movement watches? Uh, so they're they like okay. they advertise on podcasts a lot now, but they started on Indiegogo and I backed them on Indiegogo and I've been wearing their watches. So it's Movement uh, MVMT, I think, is their it's like movement watches. Um, no. But it, they're like really nice, like minimal watches. It's just like uh, it, mine was just oh, actually black with a black background, had little notches for the. Uh, different positions and then red hands like really simple nice looking watch yeah yeah yeah. okay yeah yeah i mean they kind of look pretty you know like they look like kind of other watches but they do have a a pretty nice style to them yeah they're just very simple they didn't do anything special uh, but that's what i was wearing before the apple watch Mm -hmm. have you heard of these uh warehouse or these robots in amazon warehouses uh what little scooty things that go under the stuff and like move it around i don't know yeah what you're talking about yes so the last week i went to a bunch of different fulfillment centers for amazon like just like just touring them what you say gil yeah none of this is, is top secret as far as i know but basically what i want to like it's just like Mm -hmm. this will be a short segment but it's just really cool that so there there are these robots that take up most of these like warehouses like and then there's sometimes even like Mm -hmm. four floors of just robots and it's interesting because these warehouses are basically just full of products and then there are people on the perimeter uh, and the robots go to them. The people pull out what they need, and it goes on a conveyor belt, and then goes to other sections. And then the robot leaves. So what it allows you to do mm-hmm. is basically save off the walking time of like trying to find the things, but also like all the product doesn't need to be accessible. So you can save even more. Like you don't need to have lanes really. Um, so you mm-hmm. can you just have as much floor space as you have. Like seventy percent of that can be pure product, and What's interesting is that this whole system, you would think maybe they're all talking to each other or there's some sort of GPS or RFID situation going on. But the way that all of these work is there's just a big grid of QR codes on the ground. And that's how all of these robots know where they are and where all the product is. So they they can't really see anything. All All they're doing is they're working just in this grid system up, down, and left, and right. And then they scan these QR codes, and that's how they know where they are. So, like, and then it picks up the kind of the shelf, basically, brings into the person. All the products are like, there's a picture of the product, and then they, and it says where on the shelf that product is. They pull it off, scan it, and they put it in a bin. And then it's like this whole warehouse is like super, super high tech. And 
like there's all these robots doing all of these things. But what's crazy is like this whole system relies on barcodes and QR codes. So it's like basically just a, like it's a very simple but very complicated. And like there's like a beauty in that that I didn't realize until I like saw it all working that you can create something so complex and crazy using like very, very simple technology, like QR codes basically and uh, a few motors basically. I don't know. It's just really crazy. But that's really yeah, all I wanted to say was like this this whole system is running off of barcodes. Well, it's, it's delightfully low tech and I, I just love that. It's just I think a lot of times people immediately – think there needs to be the highest tech solution and a lot of times it just it complicates things so much yeah like, you know even just bluetooth in something if you want to make some like i'm talking about these watches right uh even just bluetooth you know you, know, you got to have an app that talks to the watch and like you got to work out all these protocols and everything whereas if it's just like a self-contained little you know little separate system uh, yeah it, it can be just so much nicer and really well done and really effective. Yeah. Like at its core, you know, obviously it's really expensive. This is like a whole situation, but at its core, it's motors, cameras, and then stickers. And then through software, you can turn those three very, very basic, simple things into like this insanely complicated but efficient and low tech system that rarely breaks down for the scale that it's performing at. And it's very reliable and does all these things. Mm-hmm. And, and to your point, if, if these were talking to each other through Bluetooth, that would constantly have some sort of interference or they would get too far away from each other or uh, Bluetooth would just shut off or the battery life would be lower or, or whatever it would be like the more, the more layers you add on to the technology, the more it's going to make the, the more things that can go wrong. And because it's so simple, they're able to, to scale basically rolling out this whole thing to all, however many warehouses are rolled out to now. But I don't know. I just found that really interesting. Yeah. The cool stuff is simple. Those spec ops guys, they, they got basically just cameras, flashlights, you know, very simple stuff. And actually I was just at, so I was at Walmart uh, recently and they had so little little small like envelope sized package, and in it is a bunch of just QR code stickers, and it's marketed as you know track your stuff. I don't remember what it's called or really even all that much how it works, um, but I know like you know you you slap a sticker on a box and say you write kitchen on it, but then also you can scan it. Uh, so they have an app, and you know an app is not the least complicated thing ever, but uh, Essentially, that idea, which is in Walmart and probably making tons of money, is like a piece, pieces of paper or stickers or whatever in a in an envelope, and then they made an app that they probably could, you know, get some college kid to make for like a few thousand dollars or hundred yeah. dollars even probably. So, yeah, that, that's just a. I saw that and I was like, that is that is I like kind of interesting and just cool uh, for how simple it is. Yeah, like even. Like the Amazon Go store, the technology that's running that, as far as I know, like I don't have any insider information about how this thing's run. But <laughs> from like what I've just found online, it's basically just cameras. And then, I mean, not only, but not, not just, you know, computer vision, but it's that's alone is a very complicated thing. But the hardware itself yeah, isn't like super intense. Um, it's there's just lots of it, and then lots of like processing being done. I'm super surprised that they went that direction. By the way, I get that. So maybe the long term play here is that you analyze how people shop and you learn and get better and all that stuff. But to me, like I feel like you could be really effective by basically just having, you know, like just a scanner, you know, like the the automatic checkouts at Walmart, but just basically engineer it to go really, really quick. Um, and then maybe, maybe people steal more, but whatever you make so much money on how fast it is that it doesn't even matter if people steal a thing or two. Yeah. I don't know. Like the convenience of not having to wait in any sort of line or even think about anything. Like I can walk in and out 
and have a pack of Oreos in five seconds and not have to like well, do anything. It's surprisingly so you, convenient. So you, you sent me your record, right? Which was 11 seconds. And to me, that's pretty darn good compared to you know, anywhere else on the planet. But like, not only could I theoretically beat that with cash if I had like the right amount or didn't care about change that much, but also it's like, you know, in theory, this only needs to technically take two seconds, right? Like if you enter the store, grab the thing and leave, if there was some way to detect it, or even if there were just like a little scanner and you scan the barcode and then immediately after that you scan like a, like a bracelet or a card or something that has another code on it and it charges your account. But you don't even have to do that though. Like you literally are just walking in and out. There's no anything that you have to do. You walk in, grab it and leave. So the, the only time that it takes is the time it takes to walk to what you want, grab it and walk out. So, okay. Maybe I'm not totally understanding the story. It, how does it identify you? You, as you walk in, you scan a barcode, it opens a door, you walk in and then grab your whatever you want and walk out. But there's no scanning or there's no nothing on the way out. It's just on the way in, you tap it, but that doesn't take any time either. So what do you think like the literal, you know, whatever object is closest to the door, grab and leave as soon as you get in like time from start to finish, like from, I don't know, from like getting to that door, I guess. And it would be like leaving. Like scanning to get through the door takes maybe like a, a second. Scan? It feels like the doors have to at least open and stuff. I mean, I'm being really picky on this. Yeah. But like in theory, this can be a two second. Um, the thing. only way it could get faster is if it had like facial recognition and just knew who you were with no scan as you go in. Well, I'm saying, so here's my hypothetical. Like imagine a mall and you have a kiosk, right? And normal kiosks, you have someone sitting there, whatever. We're not going to have that because this is automated and all that. Imagine it's just a pile of Snickers bars and it's just a Snickers kiosk. Snickers kiosk. And if you want to buy one, what you do is, so you have to set it up and you got to do it beforehand. But say you have either in your, in your phone as like a, a wallet card or something, you have a little barcode or QR code thing. And then there's a scanner there. Um, or, or you could have some kind of card physically on you all the time or whatever. Uh, but basically, you grab the Snickers bar, you tap the card, or you tap the Snickers bar to say that you're buying a Snickers bar, I guess. And then you tap the card. And, you know, a lot of scanners, like the Walmart scanners, are going to have some stupid delay like that's several seconds and kind of infuriating to me when I'm trying to buy two things really quickly. But in theory, if you do the system right, it should be like, bleep, bleep, like that should be the scan rate and then you're walking away from the kiosk like in theory this should be under a second don't have to stop walking keep going kind of thing you're saying you have to scan each item so we would scan the snickers bar that you want to buy in my little scenario here and then you would scan your identifier to say this is me yeah yeah like how do you prevent theft but like if if you just make it that easy to buy snickers bars i really don't know how much you have to worry about that um and you know you could build in some kind of like it only dispenses, I don't know. I haven't thought that much about it. But like in theory, you can make this so that you can keep walking while you purchase something, which I think is powerful stuff. Well, the problem with that at, is at scale. So if you want to buy two things, now that whole process takes twice as long. If you want to buy three things, it takes three times as long. So there, it's like a linear scale of how much time it takes scanning versus how much pro- products like you yeah, want to buy whereas with this you scan once but from then on out there is no more doing anything yeah that's pretty that's pretty cool and i think maybe they'll they'll get even better at it so and I, a, that, that is nice imagine amazon go at like walmart you walk in grab your tv grab all of your groceries you grab you know whatever else and then you just walk out not having to scan anything like, yeah. this is really a proof of concept I mean, for, like, the Oreos that I bought. But I am imagining yeah. at some point I guess this could be, you know, in large box stores. Well, I'm over here imagining that, you know, like, I don't think people buy grocery bags worth of things at this Amazon Go store. So, and I know it's, like, proof of concept and eventually you get that yeah. at, uh, Whole Foods or whatever. So, okay, fair enough that it that it that you don't have to scan each thing individually. Yeah. Still, I mean... 
even 30 things scanned, you know, without any kind of weird delay like Walmart has is still really quick to do. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think an alternative to what you're saying is everything having RFID instead. And like yeah. maybe you scan I mean, your tough, cart. tough to do on every single product, especially when they don't come that way. It's very cheap, though. I mean, yeah. RFID you can get for less, like, a fraction of a penny. So if you're losing a fraction of a penny yeah. of margin on each project, on each product, that's not all that much if you're trying to build, like, a grocery but store of the future. But you don't make the product is the thing. So it comes without these, and then you got to apply the things, and it's got to work every time. It's a problem. But, yeah, yeah. I just I, I want to try that store. I want to set a world record on... Uh, Hey, if anyone's listening and you live in Seattle or I guess what, there's one in New York or something, uh, record. Let's see what we can do here. And actually, now that I think about this, I'm pretty sure they just mentioned, well, I don't know, because I'm listening to my backlog of Hello Internet, but I, I, Amazon Go was very recently mentioned in one of the things that I listened to. So. They were mentioned today in the episode that came yep. out. Beautifully poetic. Yeah. <laughs> we kind of <laughs> You know, I have an idea. We're just going to... Wait for Hello Internet episodes to come out. Write down each topic, and we'll just talk about that. That's you know it happens. Whatever. That's the origins of this. So I don't care. That's why we like it so much. Is we like have similar interests. So <laughs> yeah. I got. I got a a question for you. I guess I don't know. So okay. uh, this, this is one uh, I th- I thought of this a while ago, and. It's kind of in response to people say, you know, oh, America, people used to be like, it's the greatest country, right? And then you see a lot of these videos. It's like The Newsroom is a show that pretty famously made a video that, or like a clip in the show is criticism of like what makes America the greatest country in the world. And Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it is here. And like, I really like what uh, um, like Norway has going on and Canada seems pretty cool. Um, but I, so the, the thing that I think America is really good at is innovation related stuff. And, uh, just from that perspective, I have kind of a question and it's tricky to think about. So the question is, what is something that was invented like independent of the United States, but you know, was invented after the United States was was a thing. So, you know, aqueducts don't count here because America's just, or the United States just wasn't around. So, and I'm not saying like, oh, America's so awesome here, but well, it's actually really hard to come up with something, I think. I think the interesting thing here, though, is that maybe America's where a lot of these things come from, but Americans aren't always, like, a large, like, a significant percentage, I would say, aren't from American, they're like from Americans. They're from people from Germany or in Elon Musk's case from South, South Africa or from the yeah, UK, people Elon. coming to America to build these things because of the opportunities that America has to facilitate those innovations. But then there's places like yeah, Japan yeah. and South Korea that's like really making strides towards uh, like building things of the future. But they don't have, mm. I don't think they have like the market and then, or the, um, the, I think the significant thing that America has over every country, un- every country down, hands down is like entertainment. And I think entertainment plays a big role in the success of products, um, things like uh, movies and television and music. I think America is like the dominant force in that throughout the world yeah and i think that kind of puts us on a different stage of everybody else yeah so i'll give you the entertainment thing because it does seem just like united states culture stuff just is everywhere i mean this is this is biased by the fact that i'm like from the united states and like i've been to some countries but you know there's there's some bias here but um it does it does seem like there's like super significant cultural influence from the United States. Um, so I'll, I'll talk it up to two things like kind of entertainment stuff. I don't have as much of a question for that one, but the innovation one, um, I, yeah, is like, what is something that came about, like came into existence that didn't involve the United States. And I'm not, so like you mentioned, like a lot of these people come from other places. 
I'm like, that's, I'm fine with that. That's like the point of the United States is that people come here and it's like the new place to do new things. And, you know, it's great too, that other countries are doing other things and whatever. And it's, it's not like innovation is inherently a high point or anything, but, um, it's just, it seems like that's what the United States is pretty good at. Yeah. And so if you like flip the question on like, what are some things that came about in the United States and like, like not involving other countries as much. And like, I don't know this for sure, but like, you know, most of those big five, you know, like Google, Facebook, uh, Snapchat, Airbnb, it, I could just, and again, this is biased because like, this is where I'm from and I'm sure there's other things, other places and people know of all kinds of like inventions local to their countries. Um, but it, I, I have trouble thinking of like a really famous one. <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, obviously, there's things like Sony, like it's not like an N- Nintendo, like the like those big companies. But yeah, I guess those yeah. aren't really adv- inventions unless you're counting like gaming. Um, I mean, I'm mostly talking about like airplane, internet, you know, these big, huge culture things that everyone kind of has an idea where they came from and stuff like that. I mean, there's plenty of obscure stuff, I'm sure, that yeah. has been invented, like, exclusively in Germany. But, like, the the big things seem to come from here. Um, the, one, the one notable exception that I have thought of and checked into a bit is that, as far as I'm aware, Marconi seems to have invented the radio completely independent of the United States. Marconi? What's that? Like it's, my it's the guy that, that invented the radio. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think I think it happened in Great Britain, stayed there, then eventually like it got to the United States. Um, and it's a pretty broad definition here of like, in like, what counts as like influence of the United States. So you know, like if there was collaboration across two countries or whatever, I'm I'm counting that. But like also it. it it's still pretty broad category of like all of Europe and, you know, South America and Australia and everybody like what notable inventions have these places made that are not, um, just have no at all. Like the United, the Wikipedia page doesn't say United States at all. Pretty much. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the thing I wish I knew more about. Just like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I guess my view on things are very limited, obviously, to the United States, and I don't have like a, I don't know a ton about the history of of these things or how even America or why you know we are so influential. But yeah, I mean, we're not super qualified to answer that question, and I could be completely off base. And you know, maybe there's a whole whole lot, and it's just I'm not exposed to it. Um, but for the time being, I'm gonna I'm just gonna think that that's kind of what America's good at in, in innovation. And as you said, in entertainment seems pretty much like a, like a big thing that we do. Yeah. Uh, pretty unique and special. And you know, if that's your thing, it's a good place to be. If it's not your thing, you probably not the best place to be. I love innovation stuff. So this is, you know, I'm into this. So yeah, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. And it's, it's obvious that, like this is the place to do that. That's why Elon Musk came here. Um, oh, he would have like, he would have gone somewhere yeah. else if that was the best place for it. But he's like, if we're going to do electric cars, America's the place that I feel like I can get that done. I think that says something. Yeah, I mean, it's not like he is the complete voice of reason as much. Yeah. as I love some of the like he's he's cool. I love him, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's he's pretty unambiguously said like America seemed like the place to get this kind of thing done. Which is pretty cool. Because South America, right? Don't they? I thought they were all right at that too. Like innovation stuff. I don't know. Maybe not. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. Maybe maybe I don't know that at all. I don't know. But um, yeah, it was, just, it was just a comment and kind of a question. And I would love to, you know, if you think of something, if anyone listening thinks of something that's like a big thing that it was invented when America existed uh, and didn't involve the United States at all. That that'd be cool to know about. Aside from the radio, the radio is my, <laughs> and maybe Spotify. I think maybe Spotify came about totally independent of the United States. Really? 
Yeah, I want to say they're based in like the UK. I would imagine I like a bulk of their user base is from the United States, though. But I, th- I think I remember a time when they weren't here and they were in Europe. Oh, really? Maybe I'm imagining that. Yeah, I don't know. Hey, Spotify CEO. <laughs> <laughs> right to us. Yeah. So, flags. Um, we're from Kentucky. or you're, I don't know if you're, you're not from Kentucky, are you? Uh, no. No, I'm not. But we were at both in Kentucky at some point, and our flag is awful. It's blue background with a, um, you know, crest or whatever in the middle. What, what is it? What is that called? Uh, seal. Seal. Yeah. There's a seal in the middle. Uh, and it's very ugly. And I was hoping moving to Seattle that I would get a new cool flag, um, for Washington state. Um, but I have not. Mm. Uh, the best flag that I've had is and this is like a real tragedy. Uh, is Louisville's flag. So if you ever look up Louisville's flag, their old flag. I look up flag. Their old flag or their new flag? Oh, I don't know. The old flag is great. Um, I like the old flag. The old Louisville flag is like, um, it has the fleur de lis on it and it has like a circle of stars and there's like, but it's like nice and simple and it looks good. And it's like, I see that flag hanging places, but then they got a new flag that just says Jefferson County really big on it and has like a seal and it's just awful now. And I have to look up Seattle's flag. I actually forget. So the Seattle flag looks like a bunch of waves. It's like somewhat complicated, but it has like a bunch of text on it and it's also pretty bad. The Washington state flag's pretty bad, but on my way over here, I got to kind of see like what, People, like what places with good flags look like. So I drove through Colorado and Colorado has a great flag and you see it everywhere. It's like on all the signs, it's on everybody's cars, it's waving everywhere. And I just don't see that either here in Seattle or in Louisville or oh, even like wait, the state you, flags that I, I, I just don't see it anywhere. I was going to say, what is the Washington state flag? Is it any good? Um, talk about that. I've looked it up before and I just kind of wrote it off as being bad. And I kind of like forgot what it looked like. Okay, so the Washington State flag. Memory. Yeah, it, it's solid green oh background God. with. <laughs> yeah. It says it says the seal of state of Washington around it with George Washington's head. So it, I think there was a miscommunication, and someone was told to design like a coin. Right, I know. <laughs> And then they, they accidentally made it their flag. It's like a super detailed picture of George Washington in the middle. Uh, even these colors that I'm seeing are all different colors. Green, all the different shades of Washington's face, different yeah, fonts right. around the seal of the text. It's like, geez, like all these flags are so bad. And I was, I wanted to petition when I was in Louisville to go back to the old flag. And but I, I never did. But yeah. um, I, would, I would just want to live somewhere with like a flag that I can be proud of. Like when I was driving through Colorado and like everybody has like the flag is just everywhere. Yeah. And so the old one is it's the star circle on the left and then the floor thingies on the right. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So I'm looking at that right now. I love it. I don't know what these like what's the three I'm interested to learn. Um, right. So presumably that's some kind of symbolism. But the stars, which also I wonder what the number of stars indicates. But anyway, uh, they're they're in a circle, right? And a lot of times when you see stars in a circle, they are not rotated. So they're right, all yeah, yeah. kind of hitting each other sort of because they're, yeah, it's just, I don't like it. But this flag, it even went through the trouble of rotating these stars. Yeah. And I really appreciate that. So Yeah, I do like that too. And it's like symmetrical. So the bottom two stars like cuts with the one star at top. So there's it's not like a weird asymmetrical situation going on in that circle. Yeah. So it, it's not like it's not the I don't know. Do you think this would be adopted as like a symbol or has it been in the past? I guess No. Since I mean, flag? I don't think that this is like a great flag. Like any flag yeah. with stars, really, I feel like oh, that's been done. But it's it's fu- like it's good. It's yeah. like it's not awful. Like they're like the new flag that says Louisville Jefferson County Metro on it in nineteen or seventeen seventy eight, <laughs> and like this weird three D fleur de lis on it. 
like what made them think that that was a good idea switching like moving to this there's even like if you zoom in there's like lines in the background it looks like it's like on like paper or something oh yeah it's it's just awful (laughs) (laughs) somebody sketched that on a notebook and they just left it yeah no it's like they just like they had a stamp and they uh, they had like uh, the seal stamp. They stamped it on a piece of paper and scanned it and turned it into this flag. <laughs> yeah, it's just I mean, maybe there's some symbolism that I don't know. There has to be some kind of a reason, I guess, right? Yeah, but I'd be all for making a singularity flag if you wanted to get into what that is, or maybe yeah, all these CEOs listening can uh, have a flag design competition. This is pretty much the extent of uh, that particular <laughs> note is that it would be cool to have a flag. And that's kind of all I, I got on that one. I, I like our colors a lot. So and it, so we could just put the logo on it, right? But uh, I think there's you can have more fun than that. Yeah. I don't know how, but I think it should not just be the logo on the flag. And I think it should use the colors. And I don't know. I think we should give that a go or... Yeah, maybe once there's yeah. some listener base, ask for submissions. I don't know. I think, but I think what would make it cool is like to have like the symbolism have some reference to the episodes. So maybe like let's make a commitment now at episode like thirty or fifty, we'll make a thinkularity uh, national flag. The no, national flag. <laughs> well, yeah, we're starting an empire that we're going to go to war against Hello Internet. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know what? But I don't know. <laughs> Let's take them. <laughs> it needs to have some sort of reference, I think, to the show, would be, which would be cool, similar yeah. to what Hello Internet did. But just so it has, like, so it can have some meeting. And I don't think 11 episodes in, maybe we have that backstory yet. Yeah, I mean... Life in the internet and it's two dudes talking, I guess, is, is our current yeah symbolism to go off of in our colors. I really like how those colors came out. It was it was pretty much, I typed it, I don't, I randomly, it was not a scientific process, but yeah. I really like them. Yeah, I, yeah, it was, that was interesting to go through. I've never like made any sort of logo, but we both kind of like made kind of logos separately. And then like over text one night, we kind of like just did lots of iterations on one of them until we came up with this. And I, I think it, I think it turned out really good. Yeah. Thank you, Larity. I got, I got two things about Reddit, which seems like a segment. I don't know. It's, you know, it's kind of basically paper cuts, but these are specifically like web internet, like either YouTube or Reddit pretty much. So it's a little bit more specific. Uh, just things I've noticed. Okay. Uh, so the first one is man. So I'm using old Reddit because I, I think I officially hate the new design. Oh man, I like it so much. Uh, you're resource you're against a lot Reddit. this episode. Against the Apple Watch. Against Reddit. I don't like change. <laughs> Uh, but it's, yeah, I just, well, so anyway, I'm using the old one. I don't know if this is a problem on the new one, but it is so annoying to get back to the main subreddit or it, it used to be, right? Have you had this problem? To get back to the home feed or I think you say subreddit. To, yeah. Whatever subreddit you're on to get back to like the home thing you would land on if you typed in just Reddit dot com slash r slash whatever sub you just click on the logo in the top left yeah well here's the thing are you talking about on the new one or the old one then i'm on the new one well so yeah i i bet it's easy on the new one because they fixed something in all of their uh debauchery (laughs) 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 but the old one if there is a link up in the top part banner thing if there is a link and there's not always a link cause they mess with the CS and or CSS and whatever. But if there's a link, you click on specifically the subreddit. Like if you click on main Reddit, it, even if that main Reddit logo is stylized to look like this subreddit, you click on it and it just takes you back to Reddit. You click on the little, um, I don't know. I just find myself constantly ending up just back on like reddit.com when I mean to go back to the, the home mm-hmm. for the subreddit. 
Well, let's get into why you don't. Why don't you like the the new one? That it's it's just everything's uh, kind of in the same place. It just looks nicer and it's, well. So first of all, I have seen some other people agree with me, and so I feel uh, justified <laughs> in my hatred. But it, yeah, mostly resources right off the bat, and then second is when I go to Reddit, I am trying to do something. Like it's never just lollygag around. Oh, what's, what's new here? You know, like I, I want to post or like look at my account and just a lot of changes on this new one that I never feel confident and I just go back to the old one. Um, that, that's the two big ones. And I, what are they really adding? Did they add something in all this? I don't know. Well, my my favorite part is so when I was using the old Reddit, I would um, turn off all CSS styling just because. Depending on the subreddit you go to, it looks like everything is completely different. A lot of them are just designed really badly, mm-hmm. and this—that's what I like. This it tells you. Go ahead. I just—I don't know. I just don't like that. I like it to be consistent with like customizable sort of segments, which is kind of what this new one is. Um, it obviously just looks cleaner, but then also just like I find the navigation a lot better. So like search is so much better on the new Reddit. And then you've got this left sidebar here, um, which is much better than the drop down. I think mm-hmm. that has like you could search your subreddits that you're subscribed to, uh, your multi reddits are there. You've got favorites. Um, okay. Just like navigation and search is like so much better. And then, like I said, more kind of uniform styling of all the different subreddits. I think looks much nicer. Yeah, I'll give you the search stuff, but. Uh... So here's here's the analogy I have for this on on Twitter or whatever. Let's say Twitter. Uh, a lot of times I'm like, I like Twitter, right? Because it you you can only do so much with the design on Twitter. You know, yeah. banner, <clears throat> profile picture. You, I mean, you can actually do a lot. Uh, banner, profile picture, color, uh, bio, link. And then you control who at least you follow uh, and, you know, likes and tweets and stuff like that. But anyway, my point here is that in a glance, this ability to customize gives me like a really good idea of just is this, you know, it's, it's really weird. It, I was trying to kind of quantify this before, but like, it's crazy how quickly I can get, I think, a pretty accurate impression of a brand. I just like glance at their website, glance at their Twitter, yeah. and things look good. And then, yeah, if they pass the really basic test, all right, do they have recent tweets? Do they have a lot of followers? Uh, and that's like all you got to do to pass this test. But it, it's so accurate, I find. Yeah. So my point here, though, is that to kind of strip subreddits – First of all, new format, so I guess everybody has to do it again, or I don't know how this works. Um, but to strip them of really custom things is like an indicator of like, ah, oh, in just a quick glance of the banner and the number of subscribers, you, you have a great idea of like, how active is this? How, uh, and yeah, and it gives you the, the how many people here right now. So how active is this? How popular was it ever? And then how like, kind of serious does it take itself and and also just conveys like what is it even about right in the in the banner well there are good subreddits that are still poorly designed i think a good example i think is like it's basically like reddit moved from uh like myspace to facebook to where myspace was like you could have your gifs as backgrounds and you could have music auto playing and you could have all this stuff crazy stuff going on flying around the screen and then facebook yeah. forced you to do the same thing but in like i'm not taking them for facebook i hate facebook but facebook forced you to like do the same thing but in an organized way which is kind of what reddit's done to the subreddit which you know i think that craziness is part of reddit's culture yeah Exactly. I was going to say that is so Reddit. Yeah. What you described the first part. No, and I, I get that. <laughs> but, and, you know, maybe it is nice for like some subreddits to have the option to adopt the new layout or do the old one or like do like the super customized route. But like the 
or maybe there's somewhere in between. But the big issue for me was like, I don't know, like basically what you're saying, like, I don't know what to click on because everything's different on every subreddit. Like, how do I get back to the subreddit homepage? How do I get back to Reddit's homepage? Like, where is everything? And it's just like super confusing. And like, I don't like, at least the way I use Reddit, um, you know, I'm, it's about conversation. It's about finding interesting things. It's about reading conversation. All the, all the stuff around that is like an interesting theater, but it's kind of exhausting after a while. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's inconvenient, but it's not a deal breaker. And you know what though? It leads into this other point that I have here where even in the new one, I bet Reddit is pretty ghetto, right? Like, I always go into this thinking, and I think we talked about this before, but I was like, surely cross-posting, there's like some mechanism or something. Well, for a while, I think you just wrote cross-post in the title of your other post. Right, yeah. <laughs> you like, uh, there is a button now, but for a while, like, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. Yeah. Uh, and things like, so I posted to Ask Science, and you know what happens? Immediately, a robot, uh, like, bot automated not even like a function of Reddit. It's like a thing that I'm pretty sure the subreddit created. I don't, I don't know if it's hosted. I don't know how these things work, but these bots, uh, instead of just like not letting me submit because there wasn't a question mark on the end, I submit, it posts, the bot immediately informs me that it's never going to go out onto the real subreddit because I don't have a question mark at the end. Mm. And it's just like, could could we not have just programmed that into the submission thing? Right, yeah. And this is a stupidly popular Reddit. It sounds like it would take three lines of code to fix. Um, and I'm surprised by kind of how limited it, it is sometimes. And a lot of things like that where just y- you got to flare it afterwards because there isn't flare while you're posting a lot of the time. Or maybe there is now, I don't know. But a lot of times they say, don't forget to flare because you're not prompted to flare it. Yeah. No, that's true. There are like lots of weird because every subreddit is like has such like such different rules on what you can yeah. do. Like I could imagine why that would be difficult to like put that on the submission page or to like but I guess if you can have bots do it, like are you really saving any like spam or like anything like that by not giving those options to the subreddits? Yeah. Um yeah. I don't know. It's just it sometimes the ghetto shows through the cracks and I think they're trying to modernize it and I think that's probably necessary, but yeah, I mean up until like six months ago, like I've been on Reddit for probably 10 years and there haven't really been many updates unless you're talking like the Reddit enhancement suite that mm-hmm. wasn't built by Reddit. Like there hasn't been really any updates to it in that time before like six months ago. Well, I'm not even, uh, maybe I'm complaining I don't know. Like, again, this is part of kind of the feel of Reddit. It's like, it is this kind of ghetto underdog-ish, you know. That vibe works for it, and so does this, like, sort of MySpace vibe, like you said. But I don't know. I guess things are changing. I don't like change, but (laughs) we're headed towards a shiny new Reddit that has consistent pages and probably like a lot of bugs as they update things and you know it, it's always it's been reliable at least for like years and it's just becoming a new thing yeah i guess my default is i'm always trying to like change mm-hmm. um so maybe i'm biased in that way but I, mm-hmm. I do like it i think i want to i want to like it i just i don't <laughs> grumpy old man over here yeah here, here's the thing that relates a little bit to this is i have this question of uh so i saw incredibles 2 gorgeous everything in it is just forget the plot it's design it's just a design movie that shows off gorgeous looking things uh i mean it's a good plot and stuff too but i just love to look at everything Uh, And my question here is everything looks so good in this movie and it's set in like probably the 60s ish looking. I mean, there's modern technology and everything, but like there's a 60s, 70s vibe in there. And my question is, do old designs, do we do we usually associate them with like, ooh, gross, I don't want that because of the fact that it has just been so long 
that this object has existed and now it has aged. And I, th I think there might be a little bit of a correlation there that I just wanted to talk about some. I was just basically like, you see, you know, these things that when they're all clean in uh, an Incredibles movie, or if you get like a refurbished or whatever retro looking piece of furniture, it's really cool. And like the cars in, uh, you know, that era were like really cool looking. Even the cabs like had a really good look to them. And I love it when I see it in, in this like cleaned up manner. And then I just kind of wondered, like, maybe the only reason sometimes I'm really appalled by this kind of design is because... Because in other instances, like, I see this 60s, 70s looking stuff and I'm like, oh, God. Yeah. I couldn't live there. But I think maybe it's because I see this stuff in a dirty state because it has existed for so long. Yeah. I don't think I'll ever understand, like, why things enter popular culture but i think it's just like obviously the current thing is interesting and then like depending on the style or maybe the decade or the generation or whatever older things are either good or bad like depending on what time it is so like maybe in the 90s like 80s clothes were awful because they were the last thing but now people wear 80s clothes and it's like cool and awesome so he just, like it goes through these phases and I don't know why or when or like, I, I just don't understand it, but I think it like becomes a different thing. Like it's not like it, it, it I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but like the old things like old furniture, like it kind of, it turns into its own thing. You're no longer like comparing it to the modern standard. You're saying, Oh, this is cool for the eighties and that's why I like it. Or this is cool for, uh, like 1920 and that's why i like it it's more of a decoration than it yeah. is like I don't, I don't i don't really know what i'm trying to say well just like meanwhile over here i'm looking at uh my my example here is you know how they're modernizing wendy's and mcdonald's and all of these places to look really nice yeah they do look really nice and unlike the iphone which may always have kind of a classic look i suspect that these establishments will eventually look really bad, even with this design that I consider to be like cool right now. Right. And I'm just, is my opinion going to change? Is it going to get dirtier and I'll be consistent, but it'll be dirty. So I'll think less of it. Or I just, I don't understand how that's going to work yet. Or maybe I'll always think it looks cool, but the next, the generation below me will think that it looks dumb because it was like the, the older, they'll just know it as from my time. Yeah. So there's kind of three options on that, and I don't know which one is how brains work. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how brains work. Guess we'll see. Give it, uh, give it thirty more years. We'll talk about it in episode three thousand. Yeah. And uh, we'll get back to this issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'll be uh, some late follow up. <laughs> so we got follow up from the, uh, the mid two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Paul, do you remember episode eleven? I've got some follow up. That's another side note, though. On uh, I don't, I don't like how we ended up with these years that you can't refer to as the like, the twenties and the thirties. It's like we got, we got gypped on that. Yeah, I guess like there's the aughts, the teens, the twenties, but the aughts are like nobody wants to say that. That sounds gross. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really like between two thousand and two thousand twenty. Like who, uh, like let's just not refer to anything during that time. Well. I, th I feel like the teens, we just don't have anything. Uh, and that's kind of where my prime is here. And so that's unfortunate. But then, yeah, the odd thing is like so old people styled that it feels, I, you have to say yeah. it in an ironic way. Or you're like, I can't. I'm trying to think of how people could say that seriously. Yeah, I know. We might get there. We might get to the point that people say it seriously. Yeah, that'll be a follow-up too. Boy, it's the same episode. Excellent. <laughs>